Welcome to another episode of Montana Shares, your opportunity to find out about the nonprofits that make our state so great. I'm your host, Bill Crane, and today I have Mike from Montana Wilderness Association. Hi, Mike. Hi, Bill. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. So you're kind of new on the job. We're going to put you to trial right <laughs> off the bat. <laughs> so tell us about MWA, and you've been around for about 60 years. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, first off, I just want to thank um, Montana Shares and also um, HGTV for having us in the first place. But uh, yeah, it comes down to the fact that we started December 5th, 1958. Uh, it happened when Ken and Florence Baldwin got together 100 friends and they just started writing letters to save the Madton and Gallatin ranges. And since then, we've really focused on that community development, that, that focus on involving very different people in protecting public lands. I mean, if you look at it, if you've hiked in the Bitterroot, if you've, uh, or the Bob, or the Bear Tooth, if you've uh, fly fished in the North Fork, if you've floated on the Bear Trap or the Brakes, you know, even if you've opened your tap in Ennis or Bozeman, you've seen our work uh, firsthand. And that's especially prevalent now in that um, our wild places and our wild rivers are the number one attraction in Montana. In fact, it brings in $7 billion to the outdoor recreation industry along with um, about 71,000 jobs. So we're very, very um, involved in that and we want to push that and kind of ensure that our public lands are protected. Mm -hmm. And so you work collaboratively. That's one of your main sort of focuses to mm -hmm. make this work because we're a really diverse state, right? Tell yes. Us, give us some examples of this collaboration type work that you do. Yeah, uh, the best, uh, there's s some good examples. Uh, two that come to mind right now are the Hold Our Ground Coalition. We're involved in uh, protecting the Upper Missouri River breaks. Uh, we mm -hmm. actually involve the voices of 24,000 Montanans to voice their concern about make, ensuring that that stays a national monument. Uh, recently, we're involved in the Gallatin uh, Forest Partnership. So what they're doing right now is they're working on uh, trying to preserve 70,000 acres for watershed protection area, in addition to also setting aside 130,000 130, acres, excuse me, of wilderness. Um, but the big one that we're really involved in, we're incredibly excited for, is the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act. So thanks to Senator Tester, this act is actually now going to a Senate hearing next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, and what it is, it's a collaboration of everyone from the timber industry to snowmobilers, outfitters, guides, um, and organizations like ourselves, and everyone who uses those lands around. It's, a, it's in the Sealy Lake area, mm -hmm. our ranger district in the Lolo National Forest. And what we're trying to do um, that act will protect uh, three, three different um, kind of areas. So the first is timber. Um, there's the Southwest Crown Collective. They actually um, brought in $30 million, $33 million of revenue into that area. The other one is recreation. So working on very specific paths for snowmobilers and bikers. And the final one is conservation. And that's one that we're most excited about and that we're hoping that it can add 80,000 additional acres to um, the mission the Mission Mountain Wilderness, the Bob, and the Scapegoat. Um, so that's, that's, that's a great idea, that's a great example of how bringing very different groups of people together uh, can bring about such an amazing uh, result as we're seeing in the fact that it's now in the Senate hearing next Wednesday. Okay, any guesses on how it's gonna go? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, we're hoping, as we have uh, Senator Tester supporting this, mm -hmm. uh, we've been working with Senator Dane, so we're really hoping that this can, this can get through and this can add so much more acreage to those areas up north. Right, so let's kind of just stray, you mentioned these dollar figures. Mm -hmm. so this is, we've always looked at wilderness as something like in the right thing to do. Yeah. And now we're looking at it slightly differently. It's still the right thing to do and we still need the wilderness, but we're also really focusing on, this has value to our state. Yes. And, and this is, has value to our economy. I mean, seven billion dollars. Seven billion dollars, yeah. it's huge. Yeah. Yet summertime and wintertime, skiing and, and fly fishing, these are significant parts of our economy, mm -hmm. right? So um, that's what probably will give this a lot better chance of working is understanding that it affects our economy, is that right? Yeah, and especially with our new Office of Outdoor Recreation, that's a, that's a new brand new office. There's uh, one employee and it was created by Governor Steve Bullock to really revitalize uh, our outdoor recreation. We've seen it work in Utah, and we've also seen it work in Colorado, and now, now Montana is using that model to really push that. Right, so it's being recognized at the state level that yep. this is important. Yeah, exactly. Okay, do you have any other areas that you're working on protecting right now? Uh, yes, uh, the wilderness, wilderness study areas. So for the past 40 years, uh, wilderness study areas have protected everything from watersheds to um, crucial elk and trout habitats. Mm -hmm. And um, just recently in December, uh, Senator Daines introduced a bill called the Protect Public Use of Public Lands Act, um, which will 
in effect, strip these lands of protection, and it actually makes up about half a million acres, uh, which is roughly half the size of um, Glacier National Park, mm -hmm. uh, which could be the largest loss of public lands in Montana's state history. Um, and we're trying to work with them in that we, there's areas from the Big Snowies to the Middle Fork of the Judith um, to the West Pioneers, and we're trying to voice our concern that this was not a community uh, act. It's known as S-2206, and ironically enough, it's also going to be in the same hearing next Wednesday as the uh, DCSA. Mm -hmm. And for us, we just want to get across that this, the communities were not taken into account. Everyone from packers to uh, outfitters to guides to hunters and anglers, everyone else that uses these lands were not talked to uh, by the counties themselves. Um, some counties did, but others did not. And that's what we want to get across. We want to, you can't really shoehorn in this law and try to get a one size fits all for all these wilderness study areas. They, some are BLM land, some are forest service land. And right now we're trying to work with them and, and getting, to, getting people to know these communities that were passed over in, when this act was kind of created in the first place. And again, it goes back to the focus on communities and getting them involved in this planning. Mm -hmm. And let's go back to one of your first statements. You mentioned if you've opened the tap in a certain town, in yep. Bozeman or something, you've experienced that. Let's talk about what the wilderness means to water conservation and water quality. No, and that's, and that's, uh, that's a great question. Exa like a great example is the wilderness study area, uh, the Middle Fork of the Judith. A lot of that is prime, prime area for the watershed. And to go back to what I talked about with the Gallatin Forest uh, uh, Partnership, Mm -hmm. For them, they're trying to add that 70,000 acres outside of Bozeman to protect the water that's going into those large cities. And that's the thing. It's not just wild places. It's not just land. It's also the rivers that run through them that contribute to the economies of these, of these towns and cities and small boroughs. Mm -hmm. I've had Erin with the Watershed Coalition on here, and she's got the great map. And, yep. and this whole state is about connection with water. It is. It's all, I mean, all these water It all comes down to Stars and Glacier and large mountains like that and just kind of works its way down through the rest of the state. Yeah, it splits to two different oceans, maybe even a third one some places. So yep. it, it is a key part of our state. So how else are you involved in the communities around the state? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. We uh, two, two ways that we really focus on. Uh, one is our wilderness walks. They were actually started in 1960 when our founders took a few friends out. They said, hey, listen, let's go hiking. And then that kind of gained steam. And since then, we uh, have winter offerings, uh, which we've just finished up, which we're actually, sorry, still in the middle of, which range from snowshoeing to uh, one of my coworkers actually just led a backcountry survival camp, which was really, I wish I could have made it. It was mm -hmm. last weekend. Um, and then now we're going to transition into our spring offerings. And um, with that comes our spring and the summer events, where we kind of talk about the different offerings in addition to hosting them at, well, of course, breweries across the state where we talk about what we're doing in the wilderness walks. And mm -hmm. um, what's great for people that are members and if, for our viewers, I hope if you do want to become a member, you will uh, receive our trail book, which lists out all of the hikes and how you can do them yourself too. But also what's great for our members for these wilderness walks is that if you are a member, you get to sign up two weeks in advance. Um, and that is great because some, some areas, like we actually get do a hike to the Sleeping Giant. Mm -hmm. And so people can, that usually fills up five min within five minutes once we put oh, it online. Really? Yeah, okay. so that's, <laughs> I would uh, definitely recommend if you aren't a member now, I would recommend joining before our, our uh, wilderness walks start up. Um, then the other aspect that we are very committed to is our trail stewardship. So we used to always be kind of concentrated along the Continental Divide Trail, but now we're seeing a revitalization. We're kind of really expanding to all of Montana to revitalize trails. Last year, was an amazing year for us. Um, we had 58 volunteers. We had uh, around 2,000 hours of volunteer trail time, in addition to uh, upgrading about 26 miles, so about a marathon distance mm -hmm. um, of trails throughout Montana. And that's a huge thing for us is, sure, we can talk about, we can use these collaboratives, we can work with these communities, but we actually also want to be boots on the ground you can actually mm -hmm. see what we're doing and see the change that we're bringing about in some of these trails. And so what kind of work does that entail in general? Yeah, no, what does it take to make a trail revitalized? Yeah, um, it, it can range from digging ditches to uh, weed, mm -hmm. you know, weed uh, control to uh, simply just kind of getting in there and helping cook. So we, it really ranges, honestly, um, for your different skill sets because it's not always back-breaking labor. Sure, some, mm -hmm. some parts are tougher than others, a lot of times we're just always looking for volunteers to help us with cooking and weed control and then kind of the backbreaking labor that uh, really kind of gives back to the community that we're in. Mm -hmm. And what kind of places do those take your volunteers? Yeah, uh, a great one is um, we just worked on a trail from Kading Campground mm -hmm. to 
um, Mac Pass. So it's a it's a multi-use multi-use trail, both bikes, hikers, and things like that. So that's a great example of um, working with bikes. You know, sometimes bikes and bikers and hikers kind of don't see eye to eye on certain issues. And with this, it's a great way to get people together and show that we can make trails that help both both users. Mm -hmm. I, that's an area that I have hiked in. I've actually come up from the Bernice side, oh, really? which is almost touching the yep. skating campground from the other end. And so, I don't know how to phrase this, but but the current administration, you've got some conservation challenges. It seems like there's a distinct effort to yes. privatize a lot of land and to reduce the size of monuments. And how are you guys involved in trying to help with that situation? Well, not help with that, but maybe counter that a little bit. Yeah, no, and that's, that's it's been very, it's been a challenge. Uh, 2018, we're facing it head on right now. And it always goes back to the group collaboration and the community building. Um, again, mm -hmm. like I said, December 5th, 1958, our founders, I don't think anyone would have expected back then who was in that room. You had Republicans, Democrats, uh, landowners, land managers, uh, hikers, bikers, uh, timber industry, and that's that's kind of the basis. That set the foundation, really set the collaboration model for how the organization has been since then. So looking forward, we really want to reach out to disparate groups. We want to reach across the aisle. We want to um, involve groups that may disagree with some of our views and bring them to the table and talk to them and figure out, all right, what can we do to ensure that these public lands in Montana are protected? Because that is what um, Personally, uh, as not being a Montana myself, that's what attracted me to the state, and that is what mm -hmm. I think is worth uh, fighting for and protecting, but also making sure that everyone has a voice in protecting these public lands. Right. I think we have two ways to make money in this state. One is to extract stuff from it, mm -hmm. which very few people make money off of it, and the other one is really it's a recreational estate, yep. and we can make a lot of money off of bringing people here and letting them play. Yeah, and I th I, that's completely true. I think it's mostly it's short-term versus long-term. It's like Sure, uh, there are some, you know, there are some needs there are for extractive industries, but in the long-term goal of things, again, that number, $7 billion, that is very tough to top sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of the way to attract more people to the state, and, but also make sure that these communities themselves are self-sustaining and self-producing and can rely on the outdoor industry as a great way to, um, yeah, kind of access that, that influx. Mm -hmm. And so how long have you been in the state? Been in the state for a year and a half. Okay, what's your favorite hike? Gosh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd have to say the, uh, the Bear Tooth. Uh, we went along, uh, I did a hike along the Beaten Path. It's a 26 mile hike mm -hmm. and it's stunning. I mean, granted, I haven't been to Glacier yet, so that's on the list for this year, but that's one thing that I tell people, uh, my friends and relatives from the East and West Coast and throughout the US is that Glacier is amazing, Glacier is stunning, and I can't say too much to it since I haven't been there, but there is so much more that Montana has to offer that are in these public lands and free to use and free to access. Mm -hmm. Glacier's got a new bus system starting, and mm -hmm. so it makes, for so those longer type hikes, it makes a lot of the shuttles a lot easier. Yeah. I like the um, top of Logan Pass through Granite Chalet and mm -hmm. down into Mini Glacier. Yeah. Great hike. Yeah, I'm so, excited. <laughs> hopefully you can do that one, it's yep. a fun one. So uh, let's talk just a smidgen more about membership. And mm -hmm. besides the benefits of getting in early on the hikes, yeah. tell us more about membership. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we actually have uh, 4,500 households throughout the whole United States. Um, and for us, it's a very personal relationship. Like I said, it's great. There's some great added benefits. You know, you can get in early and things like that. But in the long run, it's more a matter of we have events throughout the state where we can meet with donors and like I said, at the end of this, my email is going to be up on the TV. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And it's really making it more of a very personable um, interaction with our members because they're mm -hmm. the ones who are helping us protect these lands. But also, they're the ones that use it. They're the ones that mm -hmm. are investing in this. And I see it as an investment for a lot of our members and that they're going to ensure that this land is still protected for future generations. But as a member, yeah, you, uh, yeah, please, like I said, the, the added benefits are great, but really it's interacting with us and making sure that your needs are met and then we can do all we can to ensure that public lands are protected. Okay, gosh, sure that public lands are protected. That's probably a good thing to wrap up on. <laughs> Anything else you want to go with or? <laughs> I think that, I think that all I've done that one. Yeah. Okay, well, super. Thanks yep. for coming on the show today. I appreciate it. And thank you guys for tuning in. As always, I appreciate you coming in and watching and hearing what's going on in the state. Have a good evening.